because I want to show you something I bought at Sotheby's when Alfred was the chairman. He didn't know I bought this. But I bought this in an auction for Grand Tour Objects. And uh, I was bidding against a lady from Texas. I suspected she was Texas. She had very big hair. Um, she came up afterwards and she said, my dear, why did you buy that? What's it, what is it? I said, it's a Pompeian kitchen. What's Pompeii? I just thought it'd be cute in my den. So anyway, I'm glad for its sake that I won the bidding. I, was, uh, I wish she hadn't driven it up because she didn't know squat. Um, anyway, uh, remember what I said about feet. Here's the head of the river god. Here are these wonderful handles that any of my implements for Target would look great on it with. Here is a little measuring cup that fits over a little vessel. This would be the, essentially the first uh, Weber grill. This would be fit out with, with coals and then lit and liquids in here, liquids in here, soup over here, and a measuring cup, as I said, over here. More feet there and a little uh, figure here with wings to support the tray. I think it's all wonderful. It gives me a sense of what these people felt and the weight they made. And the tripods behind them, you know the size of these. I'll show you some in the warehouse, the real size. But these were more Weber grills found in two houses uh, in Pompeii. Three legs, why three legs? Determines a plane on rocky floors, right? Right. Okay, so here are more three-legged fellows like that taken from the Pompeian urns that you see there. This is, this is another copy, not by me this time. This is uh, Aurora um, by Guido Reni in the uh, uh, a palace in Rome, the ceiling. I actually like mine better. Um, I think because his is a fresco. Uh, but and this painting is, is superbly done I bought it in Chicago, 300 bucks. Nobody wanted it. They just wanted things that looked like Picasso. Uh, um, and there are cups, um, Biedermeyer mostly uh, cups. Again, the handles fascinate me. And I show you this because of the Joseph Hoffman pot there. And now I'm going to show you some pots in a moment. But this pot. Um, uh, is the end of a little story. I designed, as Alfred said, the Humana building in Louisville. And during that time, I was going to meetings at the, the Whitney Museum, also with Alfred, uh, and uh, about the addition to the Whitney. And everybody uh, would, would arrive on, more or less on time, and I would try to get there early because I knew Alfred would be early and as he was. But one day I was uh, too early and I went across the street in a little shop that uh, sold modern furniture and trinkets. And they had this Hoffman pot. And I went back to the Whitney, this was before cell phones, and I called the, the chairman of, of Humana and said, Wendell, his name was Wendell Cherry, I said, you've got to have this. There are very few of these. There are more in silver than in brass. This is one of the very few. It's one of his best works. You can afford it. It goes with your Hoffman and collection and your De Chiricos. He was sounded a little irritated. He said, Michael, I'm right in the middle of something. I took your call, but um, I really don't have time now. Uh, send me a letter and I'll see what I can do. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be in New York, so I really won't have time to, to uh, to look at it. I said, okay. The next week, again, I was early for my weekly board meeting at the Whitney, went across the street, the pot was gone. I said he had his chance. And because he could have picked up the phone and, and bought it sight unseen. He trusted me that way. I don't know why. Um, but anyway, we got to the opening of the Humana building 
It was a black tie affair, of course. Everybody was giddy with happiness, on budget, on time, and all that good stuff. But the chairman was very, very happy. And everybody was being congratulated, even the contractors. And so they came with their wives, and so on. everybody was shaking hands, and, and uh, Hollywood stars were there. Everybody was there. And I don't know, I was last. And so Wendell Cherry had me come up and thank me profusely. It was embarrassing. It was a little bit low the way uh, when uh, the way uh, Alfred said such nice things about me tonight. And uh, I was walking back to my seat, and he said, "Oh, oh, by the way, come back. I've got something for you." He had a box about this big, and I said, "Wendell, thank you." Turned around and shook his hand. I was walking back to my seat, and he said, "Don't you want to open it?" I said, I know what's in here. <laughs> so he had picked up the phone, bought it, and knew I loved it. Well, I'm fascinated with all buildings, but I'm fascinated with round buildings. I'm getting less fascinated with, with <laughs> computers these days. Than how I am. <laughs> Especially when those who use computers don't know how to draw. But I also started collecting uh, these little temples of Vesta here, there are about a dozen of them there. They're all different. They're all done by people on the Grand Tour. And so if I've got a dozen of them, 15, whatever, I know there are many, many more that I don't have. But when I started collecting them, they were $5 a piece. Now they're a little more. But here's the Temple of Vesta in, in Tivoli, uh, which I painted again after, after Corot. Walking from my dining room now into my kitchen, you should always have, walking into your kitchen, a still life because, of course, it is about the cycle of the day and the harvest. We won't go into that. I talked a little bit about that today in, in Alfred's class. Oh, shit. Uh, there's the, dining, the, the, the kitchen with probably too much target in it, but I made... Uh, <laughs> I made this, these three jars here. I really want them to produce. And the buyer and his wife were coming for dinner in Princeton. They were on their way to New York. And they came to Princeton, and I, 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 I begged Target to send me these, which weren't going to be produced. And I knew that the, the buyer's wife would love them. And I said, Judy, you've got to tell him. Tell him to buy them. And she did, and he didn't. What he did was, he said, he, Mike, oh shoot, um, you can have the, oh, I'm so sorry, so sorry. Forward, yes, thank you. You can have the big one, but I'm going to write cookies on it. <laughs> um, when you work for Target, you don't get your way every day. You know? But here's my breakfast room. Uh, which is a delightful little room where I get top light, double height volume, makes me think that I'm somewhere in Georgian London with these great faux stones on the wall uh, next to a, a great Robert Adam house or something with a lot of plates and things that I've done for various producers like Swid Powell and Alessi and so on. And then a little view out to my terrace out behind which used to be owned by the house in front of me, and I couldn't open the doors until I bought her house after she croaked. Um, I had to do that to protect myself. And the second floor is here. I won't go through all of that. Two really wonderful chairs. These aren't classic, wonderful things that you would find in the museum, but this is an American Clismos chair from 1910. So don't let anybody tell you that Charles Eames invented uh, plywood that was shaped. This is a bent plywood back on a Klesmos chair, American version. And a, um, for the Egyptian revival, uh, a department store uh, in London made Egyptian revival furniture. Of course, in Egypt, this would have been painted white with hieroglyphics on the side and so on. But how, look at the structure of that. Oh, and by the way, you've noticed, well, did you notice more feet? Um, the study 
is only there because I like to tell the story that I was making this building a pretty close replica in some areas to the original warehouse. It had a concrete floor, but at the time I had a new girlfriend um, and this room was getting finished and she said, you can just barely make it out here, a wooden floor. And she said, Michael, I've noticed that when I'm in Princeton, she was in New York, she said, I, I noticed that you go to the office every night and you work till midnight and you come back. She said, if we're to get together, you're going to work at home. So make this room, not a guest room, it's really too small for a guest room, make it for a desk for you so you can do your work at home. I, and, and by the way, it has to have a wooden floor. So I did all that, and then she left. <laughs> my bedroom, it's good that it follows that, my bedroom, and here's a, a window on the Via Condotti, uh, of, a, of a hotel on the Via Condotti, which has this system of an outer uh, shade, as you know, shutters, and then a metal one, which is purely modern, which keeps out all the light and some of the noise, and then an indoor shutter, and then the drapes. So you're pretty well insulated from the street, which is right down here. I had rented my house in front that I told you about to Fran Leibowitz. Uh, Fran's a very good friend of mine and a writer sometimes. She's had a block for 20 years. Um, but she came to Princeton to write because it was quieter. She finally left because the sound of the leaves falling in the, the autumn was too, too horrific for her. So <laughs> she left. And, and while she was there, she did a film by BBC on my house. She said, don't get big head about it. They asked me for the best building in the United States. And she said, yours isn't the best, it's just the closest. <laughs> so, and I'm lazy. So she was sitting on, sitting on the edge of my bed here oops, talking about the view, the view she had from her windows up in her house, which were just up out there, looking back at me getting dressed in the morning. Well, she wasn't really interested in me. She likes girls. So I, I, was, I wasn't worried about that. But I did think that she wasn't forever, so I, I did get shutters. That's not a very good view of my new shutters, but they work admirably well. Um, let's go with this. Um, one of the cha changes I had to make after paralysis um, uh, is, is here in that one of my closets um, got changed for, oops, shoot, can't you learn? For a big shower, a roll-in shower, and it's seen here. The double head, that was just wishful thinking. Um, <laughs> Minnie, my nurse, and I roll in there, and she's, she's fully clothed, I can tell you. I, I can give myself a shower without getting her wet. But there's a little clock here. And I wanted to show you this guest room uh, bathroom, which has a little French balcony where you can open the doors and see what the weather is like. But here's that clock again, and it's a Biedermeyer clock, and it, it's appropriate that the, the watch, not a clock, the watch inside is a little crooked in this picture, because the owner would take the watch out in the morning take it off to wherever in Munich, the mill or the, the brewery, keep time for himself all day long, come home, put it back inside, and the interior of this, ooh, shoot, the interior of this was void and was a kind of secret compartment. So when Alessi asked me to make a, a, a clock for the mantle, I made this clock, which we call the timekeeper and it too has a void inside, get it? And you can put your billfold in there at night or whatever. 
Did you know why all advertisements of watches and clocks are set at 10 after 10? Look in the paper on Sunday when everybody will be advertising a watch. And remember I said that. It shows the time very well. It's actually eight minutes till 10. It's when Lincoln was killed. Lincoln was shot. And that's, but it's, it's something that all watchmakers know, even European ones. But here's that Joseph Hoffman pot. And then when um, the director of the Newark Museum retired, they asked me to make a pot for him. So here's his 25 year pot. And then more for, for uh, Stu Ben over here. And a whole lot of them here that I bought at the Porta Portesi in Rome, which is their flea market. And those then developed into these handles. And this is the way the Alessi tea kettle got started. A dozen architects were asked to design <coughs> a, a tea service, a coffee pot, a teapot, a sugar, a creamer, a spoon, and a tray in sterling silver. It didn't matter how much it cost because they were only going to make one. Think of this as somebody who was going to come to America for the first time and the strategy here, the marketing strategy, was to show how Alessi didn't make st stainless steel tea kettles. They were an art house. So they had these highfalutin architects do models, do drawings, do etchings, do everything. And we each were given a little room in all the museums and all the galleries that showed this sort of thing. And they did one in Detroit here. And <coughs> I think Detroit might have one of these. I'm not sure. Um, but it uh, has one of these, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> but here is my sterling silver tea kettle. And if there are no Republicans in the room, I'll tell this story. Um, I went to the White House for dinner one night. And afterwards, I was summoned by Mrs. Reagan to come to the Oval Room, um, or the Blue Room, or the Red Room, one of those rooms. And I did that dutifully, as I was taken by a Marine twice my size. And I said, hello, it's nice to see you again. We had met, and it was the same girlfriend I got the floor for before, and she knew Mrs. Reagan from Hollywood days. So they did their little air kisses. And so we, we then talked and she said, well, I bet you wonder why you were invited. And I said, yes, I do. I thought it was because of my, my work. I didn't say that, of course. That was too bold. Um, I said, yes, I'd love to know. Why am I invited? Why are we invited? And she said, well, I know your tea service that you did for Alessi. And you may not know this, but we're not allowed to buy it for the White House. And as you know, Michael, because I've seen it in print, that you love the collection down in the lower level in the basement of all the China, of all of the presidents, most all of them, not quite all, not the frugal ones. But sometime when you're in Washington, go to that if you're interested in, in design and look at those, the way they vary from each other. It says a lot about the presidents. But anyway, I said, well, I would love to donate one if I had one. But I don't own one. In fact, they're pretty pricey. And mine was 25,000. That's all right, Richard Myers was 40. Um, and so I, I uh, said, but I could ask Alessi if he would like, or the Italian government, would like to donate one to the American government. I think that would be sort of wonderful, don't you? She said, what a splendid idea. And so I asked Alessi the next time I was in Cruzinello, where his offices are. And he said in Italian, repeat again? And I said three more times what the request was. In perfect English, he said, tell Mrs. Reagan 
Alberto Alessi said, uh, <laughs> that story got in the New York Times and I sold 25 sets of these. <laughs> and don't ever sort to change the press. But anyway, <clears throat> Uh, so I don't get an angry letter from somebody. I'm not making fun of the Reagans or Mrs. Reagan. I told Mrs. Reagan the story, and she thought it was hilarious. So get a life if, you, if you're worried about it. <laughs> don't write me. So from that came two million of these. Now, that may not seem like a lot of kettles to you, but it is a lot of mother kettles, I tell you. But I wrote a very bad contract. I get one half of one cent for each one of these. You can do the math. From that, uh, more vessels. Um, here's some for Swid Powell, and this was in, I, that morning when they called me and asked me what I would like to do for them, I said, I've just broken my Melita maker. I'd like to do a new Melita set. So I did that. And and then Target came calling. Now, we didn't start until 20 after. <clears throat> All right, <laughs> Alfred. But Target was giving the money to renovate the Washington Monument. And so they called me, and they wanted me to make a, the design, the scaffolding. For two and a half years, it would be up. The scaffolding for the Washington Monument. They did not want Christo. They wanted it's something more, as they said, architectural. What's that? I did a number of schemes and models. They were uh, hard to please, but once they saw what I was doing, they absolutely loved it and were very much behind it. What we did, I wanted to tell them that we could do a little book for, this, for this, uh, this, this, the, uh, the kids, the students who would come by uh, and want to go up in the monument, see the new elevators, see a view. It was going to stay open during the, most of the renovation. But the stones that they were going to, to renovate were losing their mortar. And what their job was to, what we call, repoint them. And they were, their, their coursing was a running bond. I explained what a running bond was today, but it, it's not here in this brick wall. But it's a stone here, a stone here, a stone here. And then the next stone above it, halfway across. And the next one there, and then back to normal again. All right, that's a running bond. This is a running bond. So I thought it would be interesting to show that even stone buildings needed help and care, not, not just wooden ones that needed repainting and re this and that. And so uh, <clears throat> I wanted them to know why Washington, who was Longfall, um, what, um, what in the world were they having a competition for an obelisk in 1850? Who was Washington? Why did they name Washington after him? All of those kinds of questions that a first grader might ask. Then I got a call from Mrs. Clinton, who said, Michael, you're close to the, to the target people. Could you ask them, now that the monument is done, and I hear they want to take the scaffolding down, could you ask them to leave it up for three more months and pay the rent on it? This was easy, easier said than that one. So I called the chairman of, of Target and he said, no problem, we'll rent it for three more months because the American government wanted to have the change of the millennium at the Washington Monument. So I thought, oh boy, another dinner. Um, and indeed it was lunch, dinner, breakfast, it was everything. But Here's 2000, she, Mrs. Clinton said that, she said, well, you know, in, in Paris, they have the Eiffel Tower. Well, damn it, we've got the Washington Monument, and we can light it with your scaffolding. So she was very happy with it. That was a big success. But from that, uh, since I was such a pleasure to work with, <coughs> uh, one of the vice presidents came to me, vice president of hard goods. I didn't know what a hard good was, and we won't go into that. So we, he came and he said, Michael, have lunch with me. I've got a proposition for you. The proposition was to make maybe six objects 
for Target. He said something really wonderful. He said, we've been knocking you off for 20 years. It's about time we came to the source. So that was terrific. Um, I thought it about time too, but, but I hadn't noticed the impact in a Target store at that time. Um, but anyway, uh, after he saw the first six, he said, no, we have to do more. And we did two or three dozen objects. We took them to the Whitney Museum one, one night when the Whitney was closed, uh, as it is once a week. And the press came. It looked like the Whitney had had a show. It was like the, the, that the Alessi did with the tea service. And they had done a target job in like their old ads, you remember them. If they were, this installation was extraordinary. Uh, what they did with our objects. And then gave all the press, a great bag full of toys, of course. But they asked me what I wanted to start with. And the first thing I wanted to do was a chess set because I had remembered in the Bauhaus, oh, uh, in the Bauhaus, the, the, uh, oh, piece of shit. I'm not smart, but I am not this dumb. <laughs> <laughs> but I had remembered uh, Joseph Hartwig's great uh, version of a, of a, of a uh, chess set. And here it is in its box and how it fits in. He didn't do a board, but we did all of this for $39.95. I think you can probably get his for now $600 uh, as, a, as a copy. But I always thought his was a little too abstract, and I wanted mine to be a little more literal, and therefore made that first, and I needed one. I also thought that since the Bauhaus and the Wiener Werkstatt of Joseph Hoffman really did set out to do exactly what Target's doing, in other words, bring, bring good design to the masses, we had the chance in a big box store, if we all played our cards right, and did good products, and I had a good person with me at Target, we could do what they were unable to do because they didn't have what Henry Ford taught us all to do, and that is to make a, a line with people on an assembly line. They didn't do that. Everything was still by hand. So they couldn't, in the Bauhaus, live up to their dictum of good design for the masses. So we thought we had a chance. And here are some of the, this is Target, and this is Target, and Target, and Target. This is Alessi. Here's the bird from the, it's good to have a theme. Here's the bird flying time, of course. Um, here's another maker, uh, first products, they're called. And the influence of Rome, we can't forget that. This is <coughs> the baker's tomb, again, influenced by sarcophagy. But here are the various openings for the bread to be put into. And, and that, do you think it's a kind of warning? <laughs> do you think we're gonna be kept in here? And we really, like the miners, we're gonna have to learn to get along? I, I think so. Um, anyway, this was at the baker's tomb in Rome I really am fat. Uh, no, that's me. I am. I'm really fascinated with this, what we call intercolumniation, but I'm not here to talk about that. I wanted to show you how he symbolized his work in his tomb and that his family would be buried in these voids inside. These, this is startling when you see it. Most of you who have been to Rome have seen this. But on the right-hand side, at three in the bund, on the bund in Shanghai, is a series of galleries and restaurants that we did in an old building, 1910, built by a German architect. But this is one of the floor-to-ceiling spaces with kind of baker's tomb openings looking into this space, which is much too shallow, as you see. So not to give that away. <coughs> 